we're kind of stuck with the gallery. Okay, no worries. Um, are we ready to go back live? We are live. Oh, we're live. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, can you hear it? Can you hear me okay, Judge Henderson? I can, yes. Great. All right, let's come back into session. Uh, welcome back. This afternoon, we'll do some quick administrative updates, discuss what our witnesses told us this morning, hear from staff about issues considered at earlier meetings, and then have public comment. Uh, I want to begin with a quick administrative item for, to approve the minutes of the February 23rd, 24th meeting. Will someone please uh, move and second the minutes? So moved. Second. Any opposed? All right. Uh, we'll adopt the minutes from the last meeting of February 23rd and 24th. Uh, next, I want to introduce everyone to our newest addition to the committee, our senior staff counsel, Joy Haviland. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much. I mean, I've known Joy for, for many years, and I'm really glad to have her as part of the team. And um, she has been especially helpful with today's hearing, and has just been a tremendous addition to our staff as we slowly um, expand and take on more work. So welcome, Joy. Uh, third, I wanna give a quick update on our research efforts with the California Policy Lab. Our research partners are hard at work at finalizing the first in a series of reports on sentencing in California. The current game plan is for a series of four reports to be issued in succession with the first report focusing on the three strikes law and releasing, which we'll release in the next few weeks. Fourth, I want to acknowledge that a budget request that we made to continue our relationship with CPL is continuing to make its way through the process. And I wanna say, extend deep appreciation to the governor's team, including the Department of Finance and Legislative Budget Committee members and staff for their attention uh, to our request. Uh, next, a legislative update. There are three bills currently pending in the legislature that are based on committee recommendations. Uh, mental health diversion, which is SB 1223, Becker. Uh, and where is that currently? Uh, Senate floor is the next stop. That's in the Senate floor. Don't ask me about the other. <laughs> okay. Alternatives to incarceration, AB 2167, uh, that's Ash Cholera, and a uh, bill related to traffic offenses, AB 2746. This is from, that's from our 2020 report. There's also, I wanna add a significant budget proposal that was part of the Senate Democrats plan to expand CDCR's existing residential reentry centers, which is a recommendation the committee made in 2021, in 2021 report, um, which we are uh, continuing to watch and hope the legislature will uh, approve. Um, moving on to the discussion of today's hearing. The main business of this afternoon is, is to discuss the testimony and presentations we heard this morning and prioritize ideas and proposals for further research and refinement by staff. I want to emphasize that we are not voting or formally endorsing any recommendations at this time, but only identifying areas of committee interest based on what we heard and what was contained in the memos and written submissions from our witnesses. The goal is that staff will focus our attention, will focus attention on specific proposals and details and report back to us throughout the year. As we have done in the past, we will vote on a final recommendation towards the end of the year, and those recommendations will be published in our report. But again, today is merely a first step in the process. All right, just so we understand what we're doing. Um, so today, of course, we heard about the competency system, and I think there was actually um, a fair amount of consensus that it's a lot of problems and quite problematic. We heard a couple of um, proposals that I'd kind of like to discuss um, in turn and then hear if you guys have anything that you'd like to add to, including you, Judge Henderson, of course. Um, the first is to expand the scope of 1317, which, excuse me, 317, 317, um, which would essentially uh, and uh, competency restoration process for, which does end the competency restoration process for misdemeanors and whether or not we should expand that to other crimes. Um, the other proposal that we heard was to uh, create a timeline or suggest mm -hmm. a timeline to be created in the competency process because right now there is no timeline, at least uh, several important steps in the process. Another proposal that, uh, or idea that I liked, which may not turn into a legislative proposal, but I think would be helpful if not too taxing, would be some way to map the, 
the various options of um, mental health care, judicially ordered mental health care um, in the state. Um, I realize that that might be a mammoth task, but everything from you know incompetency of trial, not guilty by reason of insanity, conservatorships, the spectrum. So we could really see um, where the holes may be. And then the last that I, I think that I, I would suggest that we avoid is there's a discussion about CONREP and the community program director position. Uh, and the reason why I suggest that we table that is because I believe that there's a current um, budget trailer bill that may address some of those issues and it might, we might be mooted out as it were. So I think the, the biggest and um, most ambitious of the suggestions that we heard today was would be to expand 1317. Um, and I suppose there's a couple of different ways to think about it. Um, you could, in theory, expand it to give judicial discretion to almost everything. Um, or you could limit it to 1178 cases, or that means one search, one vote. Yeah, cases. Cases that were diverted into county jail. Or then there's a different but significantly overlapping population of non senior sometimes, which are not the same as 1178, but are, are similar. Um, so, Judge Henderson, before you're not sitting here, so I don't see you nodding along, but I just want was there any item that you wanted to add to our agenda before we jumped into 13 set through 317? Uh, no, no, I'm good with the agenda you've, you've indicated. Okay. So, I think that it's certainly worth exploring the ways to expand 317 and different populations that we could expand it to. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of that. Yeah. Serious, non-violent. Not serious, non-violent felons. Right. To, to include those. Bearing in mind that the vast percentage of the, in that Napa State Hospital survey over a period of time, were assaults. Right. Uh, so I don't know how many of those would have been misdemeanors or, or not. But it seemed if you got rid of uh, assaults and I think thefts was the next one. Robbery, I, right. Rob, well, I, I think robbery is a little tough. It's just general thefts were up there. But that would really eliminate the number. Of so am I correct that assaults are not serious, non violent? Civil assault is not serious, non violent, but it isn't in 1170H. So the assault cosmology gets very complicated. A simple assault, I think, would be a misdemeanor. Yeah. So then there are non-serious, non-violent assaults that still, um, you know, have, encompass a range of conducts, but are technically not serious, non-violent. And I'm looking to Rick, who would know better than me. That's correct. I mean, I think in the staff memo, there's uh, a graph that shows. Yeah. Well, yeah. Offenses related to firearms and there can be yeah. assaults related to firearms, but that makes right. me think that they're separated. Right. There's, there's, as you know, assault likely to cause GBI, mm -hmm. which can be a strike if a person does cause GBI. Yeah. Any assault with a weapon mm -hmm. can be a serious or violent offense, yeah. but but basic felony assault should not be a strike offense. Right. All right. And, and I think the only thing I want to add about the list of offenses for Napa, that's not based on the penal code. You know, so there might, I, I think it's a good roadmap for it, but yeah. it's not as if they say this is a PC 211 offense and this bucket. I think it's a little bit more of a, a general category. I don't know why theft would be on there. I, don't yeah. know that much on there. I think it would be helpful to us to get sort of how, how far up, how, yeah. how, you know, sort of scaling up and how many people are actually affected by each group. I mean, robbery is kind of, the, it seems like the big one where it's, it is a strike, um, it is serious or violent, but it's a big contributor to it. And as we've discussed in, in the past, there are robberies and there are robberies. Right. So, there's there's a right. so, right. right. so maybe we even create a carve out for estimates robberies, right? If, or is that just create complications? But, but I, as you remember, this was one of the things that I was most interested in talking about when we first got started was, the way in which petty thefts get elevated to robberies and how the, the 
SMI populations, particularly the affected ones. So I think right. that's what we're looking for. Okay. And you, and you could have here, you could have mandatory, because SP 317 is mandatory. It's if it's a misdemeanor versus a cop attempt, move on, go directly to jail. Well, don't go directly to jail. Yeah. Right. But you can yeah. imagine if you're expanding it, there's a mandatory tier, and then this, a tier that has some kind of discretion as, as part of it. And I think targeting offenses that are recurring issues like the SP problem, that makes a lot of sense because we know that's the reality of a lot of these cases. I would like, so what would be helpful to me is to try to, as best we can, and I realize the data is um, scarce or difficult to come by, is how many people are we actually affecting by expanding the different categories to the best that we can estimate. And the assault, which is so off the charts, I would put it, how much of those are civil assaults and how much are, you know, how much, we, how do we capture that? That seems like to be the most important group, yeah. right? So how do we capture as many of those people as possible? Um, if, or if it, and again, I, I do want to stress that I think the backlog is important, but from my perspective, I would like to try to develop policies that are driven by what is gets the best outcomes rather than concern about the backlog. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe I should be concerned about it. I know that other people are, but I would look at um, Criminal threats by trying to as well as uh, trying to frequently involve people with serious And I think the other thing we should just keep in mind on 317, it's new. It started January 1st. So, you know, we heard the experience in LA, they sort of had meetings and seemed to have a plan. Other counties, including for we, not just what we heard from Mr. Greco, but other places that, that Joy and I have spoken with, it's not been a uniformly smooth rollout throughout the state. Um, but I don't think because the policy is inherent as well, it's just how it's been over. Well, I do think that it would be interesting to see if there's some way to assure kind of Mr. Greco's concern about right. making sure that they don't just go, this is just not just released to the streets. Right. Um, I don't know how to make that happen, but that would be sort of interesting. Well, it seems like the incentives on the local decision maker would be a little bit different if you get some more serious cases. I think that's one of the ideas behind 317. What just Bianco was saying, where you have to force the change um, and the incentive is if you don't, Give one of these treatment pathways the case is dismissed. So you can hopefully encourage more of those options. So just to make sure we're clear, the incentive is the state law is requiring them to be released to the streets. And so you better create some program because otherwise they're just going to be released to the streets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But but for misdemeanors, that incentive isn't as strong because a dismissal of that case is not as important. But I think what Tom is highlighting is that if it's a felony offense, if you're saying, hey, we're going to dismiss that one. The counties have even more incentive to say, okay, we better develop a program. Yeah. I get it. I, I just don't know if that's like great lawmaking, but it has a history. Okay. <laughs> it may not be great, but there's precedent. For it, it. it has a history in 317, is that what you're saying? And 317 realignment was that in many respects. So you know. in some respects. Yeah. All right. Well, regardless, I think that the question of how to how to expand. 317 to capture especially the offenses that seem to dominate the, the system. Um, but at the same time, you know, assuring as best possible, not only these people who receive treatment that leads to better outcomes, but there's some way to avoid problems that would endanger public safety. Right, absolutely. And I think, you know, this is in the memo, but the data from ODR that their sort of re, the re-arrest rate for the folks who go through some of their programs is way oh, lower. Oh, no. Sure. Than the you would know, but right? To some degree, this ODR cherry pick, I mean, people that they feel like the best benefit from the program. They pick probably the hardest people. Or, right, or, or the opposite. <laughs> they actually pick the most clinically serious people. Right. Um, it's not charged case, it's, it's house it's a person who can be safely kept. So just because, because those decisions are made by clinicians. Not lawyers. Right. I mean, oh, that's interesting. That is interesting. I mean, the lawyers refer the cases in, but the, the decisions to refer the court. 
So you don't think that they're cherry picked in terms of that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we've, had some, we've, had, we've had quite a number of very serious come through and, and receive grants and recognition. Not in the SI, in the FIS, not in the IST. Yes, we, we, and I would say this to the staff earlier, ODR did not, for the creative ODR's programs, the court did not insist on a protocol we will not accept. They let it happen on that. Lawyers are different cases than we got the order. Of course, we want to grant information on the other side. So, um, <coughs> the process is adversarial and very organic, and in the right cases, ultimately, the right to the surface. It's a beautiful moment. So, Senator Skinner, just to bring you up to Sabita, where we are is we're in the process of discussing what happens today and making records making, asking staff to go back and refine proposals. And the current uh, proposal that we're discussing is how, whether and how to 317 can be expanded beyond just misdemeanors. So in other words, 317 being the, the mandatory section on the, go ahead. 317 um, says that if you're charged with a misdemeanor and found incompetent to stand trial, um, either the case is dismissed or you're, you're put into a treatment program. Is that fair? Yep. Okay, so right now we're primarily talking about the um, ICST. The reason I raised this is because I don't remember who said this, but it might have been the judge from uh, Dade County, but it was basically like, you know, the ICST is this proxy for this fact, which is that um, these very, uh, mentally ill people are uh, being housed in our jails or whatever, not being treated. And the reason I raise it is because we have, the governor's now put forward this care not courts, which while it's not specific to ICST, it is a, in effect, court diversion program that is then dependent on I mean, this is what the part is tricky. It's dependent on you having enough community-based facilities for the care. And there's funding also for that, but it would be, I think, worth it to evaluate. Some version of it will be adopted and will be put in the budget. Absolutely, that said. But what would be worth it is to evaluate whatever it is that we end up doing compared to what we, you know, learned in this session and to whether it, you know, what, what would need to be added for it to achieve the kind of effectiveness that some of the, our speakers were um, presenting to us. So I think that what you said, absolutely, that the incompetent to stand trial population is a proxy for the most serious in our system. Right. Right. Um, and it's it's only a subset. We we I think J Judge Lightman also said that in fact I think this is true that we I've seen in federal studies over seventy percent of people in jails and prisons, so around seventy percent, have some sort of diagnosis of mental illness. But these are a, a small subset of that. People are so mentally well, ill. Well, the, the care not the reason I brought up the care. Care course, course. is that it is targeted towards not just any mental ill, but those with psychosis. So that's a very comparable population to what we've been discussing in the, in the, for the panels we're discussing. A absolutely. And one of the things that we'd also discussed, which I think would be helpful, but I think a mammoth task, which was recommended by the judge from Nevada County, is if we could map out the various different ISD, non got guilty by reason of insanity, the conservatorships, just to see where, and then where would care courts fall within the spectrum. It would help me at least to understand a little bit about where things are. And I agree, it's, you know, it's almost impossible to start talking about this problem without talking about care courts. It's, um, and, every, you know, everybody seems to kind of throw it in at the same time. Like, I understand the inclination to try to want to carve out the ISD population, which we've been, and the folks who are involved. With criminal legal, system. I think that it's impossible to 
to ignore it. So I think that we have to find a way to figure out how each of the pieces fit together. Um, with regard to the expanding 317, um, whether or not that's a good idea, I think there's a lot of consensus that it, that it could be expanded. I mean, there's the difference between misdemeanors and felonies in many cases is kind of arbitrary. And sometimes people who have committed felonies are less dangerous actually you know, in terms of recidivism risk. Um, and that there shouldn't be, so again, I would, in, I think it would be helpful to staff. And I would think that there, I, I wonder if there's agreement among the uh, committee for ways that we could expand 317 to different populations. Perhaps those that are falling through the cracks because they don't have the opportunity for care for, or but, just- But then what, but what's the practical, what's the practical outcome? If it, if the practical outcome puts more pressures on the state hospitals for which we do not have, that, you know, we've already heard from the researchers that that isn't necessarily gonna give us a better outcome. That's what I'm trying to get at. It, 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 would take, it would take people away, it would relieve the- yeah. It would relieve really, okay. In fact, the vast majority of people who are um, committed to state hospitals, uh -huh. If you just expanded the bubble to the next reasonable group, which would probably be non-serious, non-violent felonies, uh, you would capture a lot of those right. people. And we know that it's a real, it's a huge group because this is what I was kind of pressing on. So many people take plea agreements for a year or less uh -huh. at the end of the day, that we know that a large portion of the people who are being committed to state hospital are being charged with relatively minor crimes. Uh -huh. And if we can capture that, it's that 75% of the okay. people. Right, and if we could somehow capture that group, I guess that that's the group that we want to have our eye on. That's seventy-five percent who are getting a year or less at the end of the day. What are those crimes? Yeah, and how do we capture that group as folks who would be diverted out of the state hospital and directly into community-based treatment, rather than going through the extensive IST okay. process, which ends up in a plea at the end of the day for less than a year. And right, I'm sure it's clean. Right. This, I, I think it's a good point because 317 was just addressed with misdemeanors, which were never going to the state hospital. The counties had responsibility for the whole competency process for them. So this would actually be expanding it potentially in a way that would help the backlog because you'd have less people sent to the state hospital and ideally getting them into better treatment, which Dr. Warburton said that's just not what they're set up to do at the state hospital, something long term. Uh, and would hopefully have the public safety outcomes too. So it would have a lot, it would, it would sort of be two birds with one stone anyway. It wouldn't just be something about the back wall, but it would definitely help with that. And it would also have these other effects that we're interested in. Right. And in an ideal circumstance, I think what we heard was that they would be diverted away from the state hospital competency system, which actually doesn't even do much except restore you to competency. So you can plead guilty to less than a year. Yeah. Into a program like they were doing in that with Judge Espinosa was running in LA, which was a community based mental health program um, that was supported by the counties. Right. Principal. But that's how do you well, it, it's both, right? So <laughs> right. we have contact with the Department of State Hospitals right. to do this community based restoration with the notion that as they um, are either restored to competency or finishing their term, we would transition them into one of our other housing programs. All of our and FIS is found in competency and trial? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. We tried to avoid the acronym of the memo. I don't know if you all know. Yeah, we tried to stay away. I appreciate this. Was a, <laughs> this was a this was a thing to come up with. Right. And there's yeah. mist for the misdemeanor population. Yeah. Oh, that's the that's the diet. All of our programs, and people refer to it, has as a goal getting the person from the supply which is how we ran into the intention of the supervisor when the bill started. Right. You know, just say yes, it's expensive, but it's much cheaper than jail. Right. right. It's expensive, but yeah. It, it, it's much yeah. cheaper than so so we had a list in LA, the five percent list of people who were mm -hmm. high high utilizing the, the jail emergency rooms the first time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, right. It, it, yeah, so I figured that that when the day judge was talking about how they were able to isolate that. I figured that's not uncommon, not every county 
has done that kind of data, but the yeah. ones that have, it's not that it's replicable. Yeah. Well, I, okay, I, I want to come back to that because I think that that's a really interesting uh, piece too. But before, so we can move on from the three sub team. So the first, I, the first proposal that we've been discussing, and to get further re research and refinement on, is how to responsibly, how can, can we responsibly expand three hundred and seventeen to divert people out of the? These are, the, as Senator Skinner was saying, the most seriously mentally ill proxy for the most seriously mentally ill because they're they've been found to have a stand trial, but rather go to state hospital, which is been relatively little utility because they come out of plea for less than a year anyway. Can we get them into some community uh, program? All right. Um, the next, uh, well, we were just, so put the, I'm going to put a period on the end of that. Judge Henderson, you want to add anything to that? No. For the time being? Great. Is the, is the audio okay, Judge Henderson? Uh, it's it's in and out, and I'm I have uh, hearing problems to begin with, but I'm I'm catching the main drift of it. I'm missing some words here and there, but it's okay. Okay, well we can also circle back and brief you on. Yeah. It's probably the. No, I think I'm 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 getting the drift of it. The, the thing I wanted to just flag, which I hadn't put on our little agenda, because but Senator Skinner, you just reminded me. I don't know if there's any way the state can or should, or this is just maybe. The high utilizer issue, I think it's really interesting. You know, I was thinking of that when the Dade County judge was speaking, did they narrow it down to like 100? Yeah, it's like 97. I was trying to put that yeah. to scale in California. <laughs> right. It would probably be 10,000. Right. Right. Really Miami's yeah. not small. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, it's not 40 million people. A couple of million? Yeah. yeah. 40 million? No, no, it's not 40 right. million. No, it's, it's right. probably the county, it's a county program. Right. Right. Yeah. But to put that to scale, I think it's a great idea. I remember reading a book when I was in law school, and you probably know it. Violent offenders, if you focused on the top 5%, yeah. they committed like 50% of the crimes. Well, let's. Yeah. A, a number of counties might have done. Jail utilization. 2.7 million. Dade County is 2.7. Right, so that's a, it's a city. It's yeah. a big yeah. county. Right. Yeah. Cool. So, so it's so five times that. People. So that's 500. <laughs> so it's 500 people. That's if you scale that up to my. Well, anyway, I don't have time. And how big is ODR? I think ODR can take them all at this point. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he had a great idea. Yeah, and support. He, he was a pioneer. When I got hired at ODR, was one of the first meetings I had. And he's terrific. Uh, and he has huge, ambitious ideas. I kept on trying to get him, you know, like we're so far behind in some ways. What would be a first step? Um, and I'm not sure he had a terrific answer, but I forget what he said. Do you remember what he said? I think it was the focus on the acute people. So it wasn't. Yeah. Super specific, but <clears throat> okay. Um, well, if we could find a way to figure out, I mean, can we even do the high utilizer? We don't have to do jail. Yeah, that's all going to be county level. That's county level. But aren't counties doing that at least somewhat with lead, even with? I think that's part of uh, lead utilization in some places is to identify who's really driving the jail population and narrow in on a certain class of people. The law enforcement, law enforcement assisted conversion. I think that was kind of one of the ideas behind that is that a small group of people are kind of cycling in and out of the system. And if you can get those people services and uh, early on, then you limit it. And so I think some counties, but they're doing it at the county level, are identifying who are the most frequent users, not only of the jail, but of kind of emergency services. And <clears throat> well, be let's, let's figure this out because I think this is an interesting uh, idea. And I think that I think people sort of anecdotally have had this idea in the back of their head that there's a small number of people. And I wonder if lead is just sort of in theory based on that, or if they're actually identifying the hundred people in, or the five hundred people or whatever. I'll tell you how lead works in Los Angeles County because that was an ODR program. Uh -huh. um, it was uh, law enforcement assisted diversion. The person at the point of arrest was referred by law enforcement to ODR. Lead was the provider. 
I think by operation, I mean, they could have had high utilizer population, but I don't know what the correlation was. I'd be happy to have staff talk to Shoshana Scholar. Have you guys already talked to her? Yeah. And we're also doing what I was trying to lead to. Oh, pun intended. Um, what I was trying to get to was that we we're also doing uh, our next committee meeting was going to be about or, or first contacts. Or perhaps we could integrate it into that. We, we, we don't, getting the data is not something we can do because it's each county, but there are some counties that have looked at it for their jail population. So we can, we can build on what exists. I guess what I'm, I'm also curious is if we, or can the, can the legislature require counties to do it? Sure. We could, <laughs> well, okay. So do whatever they want. If we require them, we have to fund it. We have to pay for it. We could fund them too. We could provide some incentive or something, but I think it is, it would be very useful data mm -hmm. because we are now, we're trying to design programs and budget lots of money for for something we know is real, but for which we don't really have that kind of population data. I mean, just by doing back of the envelope math, isn't it? If it's if it's a hundred people for Los Angeles, for Miami, and you extrapolate that to Los Angeles, that's five hundred people, and that's a quarter of the state. It's two thousand people in the whole state. I mean, it's not a big number of people. Right. So maybe it's five thousand. Let's see. Okay. But even so, if those people are responsible for that level of cost in the, within public safety, within the courts, and within whatever else, health. right? Health, then obviously you can design a program very targeted at them. We're going to have a lot, a lot of benefits. And it's we're considering other types of things to try to target, like let's say at risk youth. I mean, that could be part of the building. But it goes back to um, from your comment about the, the studies on the most violent. It's similar. The, the cities that have had really good, I don't want to say really good, effective gun violence intervention, they basically identified the shooters. They didn't have enough evidence to charge them or convict them of their shooting, but they had the detail and they. Put them, they got agreements with them and put them into different kinds of whatever paid them in effect, and their their shootings, their gun violence were way down. So it's that similar kind of thing where you've got this small number that are responsible for a huge amount of your problem. I think I, I agree. So first item of business is to on the expanding 317. Next is, is there a way that the state can encourage counties or require counties to identify the high utilizers with the idea of ultimately targeting interventions into those high utilizers? If, if it is as Miami, that is an extraordinarily small number of people. Um, we also discussed, um, can we map the universe of court order mental health interventions. Is that a good umbrella? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I mean, that is where we started looking at this. Um, so Joy, that was probably what I asked her to do <laughs> second day she was here to start making that sort of glossary and stuff. So we definitely have a, a sense of it, but you know, so much of it also, as we heard about today, really depends upon how the localities are interpreting it, funding it, and, and using it. So, you know, every county now has assisted outpatient treatment for the most part, but there's only 200 people statewide who have been enrolled in the program. So sort of doing a map of what's possible will not, um, it's just the start of that process to understand what's actually happening and to identify, you know, sort of ways to have policy interventions that make sense. I don't know how, I mean, I, that's why I started off the first words out of my mouth. This is, you know, this is an extraordinarily difficult task. I don't know how to visualize it in a way that would be most useful. Yeah. But I do think that they're part of what we've run into 
and just by reference of the acronyms, is we run into such a specialized area of law with, with, that becomes extraordinarily complicated with not a lot of expertise in around the state. It's not like penal code that applies everywhere. And I think that we're running into, and I assume policymakers with a lot of confusions, what is there in this? I mean, in some ways, care courts kind of already exist, but on the other hand, like they clearly don't. So let's try to infuse it. And I think that I uh, forget who was saying it about, but, but again, the judge from Nevada County was saying, you know, like if we just kind of understood the universe, I think that that would, and maybe we could simplify it. Again, perhaps an impossible task, but. Uh, well, let, let's think about it. I think one thing, one way to sort of narrow it is to think about the difference between civil and criminal courts. I think that's sometimes something we've heard about is, you know, the criminal case is over and now the next best appropriate step might be some sort of civil or conservatorship or outpatient treatment, but you have to go, it's a whole, it's different judges, it's a different, you know, courthouse and things like that, and that there can sometimes be no, a judge is hesitant to get rid of a criminal case because they don't know what's going to happen next, so maybe trying to bridge some of those gaps, but then you need specialized judges um, to be able to do well, it. That's precisely why you have specialized judges, because it is so. Right, exactly. Okay. All right, well, let's... We'll talk further. Okay. All right. We've done a lot of that work and it, it is, you know, it's kind of a paper tiger because there's a lot of laws that look nice on paper, but you know, what we've heard today is <clears> obviously <throat> they're not working um, perhaps. Yeah, just yeah. like like timelines if you have that in the statute. Well, that's you always well, see a timeline right. that's broken. Right, we're, we're, we're creating <laughs> a lot of it broken basically. Yeah, well, right. there's not enough resources to well, that's complete the job with your timeline. That's a good segue. And I think that I, I gather with the, the idea of focusing on incompetent Sam trial was to try to limit the conversation to not be the whole yeah, right. mental health problem. Right. And this is an, an acute problem of the of the sickest people. And again, getting back to what Senator Skinner said, that these are, you know, common Sam trial has two features. It is the most, it's the sickest people, and there's a constitutional mandate for the government to intervene. If, if they want to continue prosecution, they could say, see you later, but yes, exactly. Right. But that's the premise behind 317, absolutely. So even if we just say it's the sickest people who are arrested with crimes, you know, and, and, and that it's broken, just like on many other parts of this. Um, so to what Justice Moreno was saying about the timeline. So it seemed like that that was a critical thing that was broken as well. However, do we want to create a timeline that's just not needable? You know, it, it, or is that not is that not our problem? You know, it, it's sort of the, the discussion that you all are having around three seventeen. If there's no, if there aren't resources for treatment, does it make sense to expand the universe of cases that have to get dismissed to go into the treatment? You know, it's. And it's something that the committee has often spoken about, where if there isn't going to be the resources and infrastructure to implement some of this stuff, it's not really uh, perhaps the best policy. But is that the true of the timeline too? Look, so the state is under court order to have a 28-day timeline to get people to the state hospital. Justice Fine wrote that decision, um, and he gave it a two-year phase in. So. That's the most significant timeline, and the you know it's going to be very difficult for it to become reality. Um, maybe it's different if you put timelines around things earlier in the process, where there's a lot more, like getting an evaluation. And that doesn't depend upon the state hospital; every county can have a system for that. So maybe that's easier to be met. Um, the things that don't go to sort of one central source, where there's X number of beds, it's probably easier to get more evaluated than there are more, you know, space at the state hospital. But right, I think, you know, what we heard researching this, there's a huge, it didn't come up today, but LA can do a, a short form evaluation where they have a clinician essentially in the courthouse, they can get one done the same day. Right. Yeah. Other counties, it takes eight weeks before you can even get somebody to see your person. So there's a huge, so a timeline in LA for an evaluation, probably okay. And they also work with um, residents at medical school to do a lot of it too, but you know, other places, it's going to be much more difficult. Okay. But it does seem appropriate to have some, you know, because these, these folks are just in jail otherwise a lot of times. And if you have a system where the idea is to get them out of that uh, environment, 
if you let six, eight, two, three months pass in this regular course, it's really you know not that much. Benefit. Yeah, it seemed like the what I recall reading was that you want to avoid the whole lengthy process. Right. And if you have like two doctors saying, hey, this is an obvious case of uh, the need for immediate intervention before avoid the whole state hospital thing from the get go. Because that's where all the delay comes in, the waiting list and everything else. So cut them off at the pass. I don't see how this, part of my frustration is that everybody said this is such an incredible problem and tragedy and Um, counterproductive to public safety, yeah. and that we're gonna, and the solution is to create a timetable. This seems pretty weak sauce to me. Yeah, yeah. And furthermore, well, and it's a band aid. It's, 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 yeah. it, and the time, because they, because at the end of the day, they're just getting restored to competency to be tried, yeah. Yeah. and they're just going to plead guilty anyway and be released on time served. So do we, is there much utility in an improved timeline at the end of the day? <laughs> Even if it's met. If you have the existing system, the faster you can get folks out of uh, a non-therapeutic setting, then that seems to be. And by a non-therapeutic setting, you mean jail and into, into state hospital. Right, or a, a community-based program, right? Well, alternative yeah, community-based program. Separation. Right, you could start the, you could have a person evaluated for diversion too. That's something that's an opinion bill. Whenever there's a competency evaluation, you should also evaluate for mental health diversion, which is not, I think, the norm in a lot of places. But right, no, that, that's, but again, that's sort of a recurring issue that, that, that the committee faces is, you know, with the current system, you know, tweaking the existing system as one approach versus we need an alternative. System, which is sort of a epitome. Um, I, I'm happy to. I mean, I don't know how you all feel. I don't want to. I, I'm not ready to cut it off because it seems like entirely reasonable to have a statutory timeline. On the other hand, I'm not really super excited about it. I don't know what you guys. I'm not necessarily against it. I just. Uh, it's an incentive, I think, for the court to check things through. We, we have a lot of timelines of dependency. They're very strict, and that's a sort of a dire situation. And somehow the courts manage to, for the most part, come down. It also seems like if the first proposal, the committee recommends the first proposal that uh, 317 be expanded, then setting a timeline for that initial competency evaluation would be helpful for that. Yeah. No, I entirely, I agree with that entirely. If the, that result is community-based treatment, right. then it makes a ton of sense. If the that result is you just get, right. you know, sh held in one place and then another place faster, right. but you, the net result is you end up being three year after a year of being held. Seems marginally better, but not a ton better. But it, but it, it does seem significantly better. And maybe again, if you do do a smaller population, it's less of a burden on the different counties that they have to put everybody on the fast track. But no, they don't have to put everybody on the fast track. They just put people on who are eligible for this type of community uh, diversion on the fast track. Anyway, that's one right that I did. All right, so we've talked about 317 expansion. We've talked about the timeline. We've talked about mapping the system of judicial intervention on folks who are mentally ill. And we've talked about public safety and judicial. So, so you mean like the police? Yeah. 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 Law enforcement plus judicial. Sure. The government intervention. Of the um, and then high utilizers. Can, is there some way, is there some model of state legislation that has, uh, directed local authorities to identify how to utilize it. We don't even necessarily have a model, but would that work? I haven't seen it. We'll look. Right. Um, and it's not necessarily meant to the ill folks. Right, well, we want to define what high utilizer. I think high utilizers of the jail and law enforcement. Well, we can see what what definition Dade County used. Right. 
Yeah, we can copy their study. I think if you use broad categories like how you utilize its parent services, I don't know, you can only access three parent services. Well, I think for us too, it's, you know, again, keeping our eye on public safety, it's who is committing the most crimes. If it's truly 2,000 people in the whole state of California creating or causing so much of it, like that would be a great area of intervention. I mean, that was at least what I took away from, from Judge Fleischman, that it, was, it wasn't just a mentally ill population. It was a whole huge overlap, but it was, you know, that they were able to bring down all arrests and bring down and find the 200 or the 100 people who were utilized, were being arrested the most. And of course, those people, by coincidence, are utilizing tons of capital resources. Uh, okay. Are there other topics that came up today that we should focus staff attention? I don't think from a penal code point of view, only listening first to UC Davis research work and first showing what a significant percent of the people in the incompetent stand trial category in California were unsheltered people. Right. Um, which made me think that we might have, if we go to Gage County's example, we might have a larger number only because our, we have a larger number of homeless per capita than Florida does. And what we know and the research shows, the, just the being unsheltered increases the, the people with the psychosis type of diagnosis increases their their delusions there because it's less likely that they're being medicated and having other stable things that could help reduce that um but anyway i don't know what else we can do in the penal code regarding that because regardless of what we do in the penal code unless there is the auxiliary services, like the judge at the was pointing out, then we, we, it's, we're going to be doing mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Right, I mean, it would be pretty dramatic, but I think the only thing that we could do was say, well, is what I was going to say is that we could say that, uh, any diversion program provide out that that could be a required part of it. Um, the other thing that I was thinking as I was mid I paused because I was mid thought is truly our proposal from last year about the uh, reentry centers, mm -hmm. right? That isn't a housing program; it's a reentry program, but it essentially is providing uh, housing and leading people into more permanent housing. Um, and if you could expand a program like that to either this population or the jail population at large, it would be it would it would be a housing program, but in instead of jail. Uh, but again, I think that that's pretty far from our jurisdiction. Right. Pretty ambitious at this this stage, uh, but I do think that in some ways we could think of our reentry program as as a housing, as a housing program. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were there other ideas I want to ask Rick, Joy, and Tom? Were there other ideas or proposals that we should not drop? Anything? One step. Maybe I'll put. The one, one, this is sort of in the timeline world, but there is, um, you know, right now under current law, the judge says, okay, this person is incompetent and they're probably not going to ever be oh, restored right. because they have, you know, uh, the condition yeah. that's like that. I think some adventurous judges will make that determination, but there isn't a clear place in the penal code. Uh, so they have to go to the state hospital and go through that process and yeah. be sent back. Probably should not have to go at all. 
Uh, that's a very small thing, but I think a, a meaningful one worth keeping in consideration. So this is people who are permanently medically incompetent. I think the, the archetypical situation is somebody with dementia. Yeah, that's the point I was trying to make. Okay. But some cases it's so obvious you got two shrinks who say, you know, not just that you don't need any further evaluation. And this isn't somebody who's going to come in and out. This is somebody. Right. Yeah. yeah. So how big is that universe of people? Like we've talked about it in the death penalty context, of course, but it turns out that it's a very small number. I don't think it's that big because I think the respiration rates are like 75 or 80 percent. So it's just something. But it's, that. it's, you know, we know there's that population of people out there. So it's a small uh, week, but it um, seemed relatively uncontroversial. Also. And, you know, I think we just we could just type up what we just talked about and there's a recommendation <laughs> basically it's not a, it's not a heavy okay i'd like to I, I that's that seems worth exploring i'd like to know how many no, people no. um we get you know guesstimated covers yeah I, you know i assume dr warburton and her colleagues will have some info on that because they, they did this great study you know which is the basis for presentation today with so much of the demographics of their, of their population hopefully we can find that out pretty easily all right Anything else, Rick, Joy? No, uh, well, I, I did want to mention that there was this issue of, uh, you know, the, that, that statistic that uh, so many people had 15 prior arrests yeah. and somebody else also mentioned that many counties aren't doing the initial mental health screening. And so somebody may come in for one of those 15 prior arrests and be incompetent, but on the next one not. And maybe this is something that we address in our next meeting regarding first contact, but just that initial, it seems that initial screening of mental health should be a requirement for counties to do that. They do that initial screening to see as somebody's coming into the jail and they're not waiting because as we heard people mention today, that every day in jail counts and people are being compensated and be waiting for the evaluation. So just Kind of in that timeline discussion, this idea of like when are when are screenings happen, happening and should they be conducted when somebody first comes into the jail? But again, I hesitated on that because maybe that's something that we can touch base on at the next meeting as well. Yeah, I think that makes sense to think about holistically with the jail experience. Mm -hmm. I would say there is a pending bill that would require findings of a uh, Incompetency be part of your rap sheet so that it would be sort of part of your, your criminal history. So it'd be much more um, accessible information. All right. Well, um, I think we could chew on that, decide whether or not it fits into uh, whether it fits into our next meeting or not. If it doesn't fit into our next meeting, we could certainly include that in further research. Sure. Um, because I think if we keep if we cabin this conversation to competency, it's rather limited. Whereas I think that law enforcement assistant diversion and early evaluation for mental illness should be broader than merely the incompetent to stand trial population. Judge Henderson, is there anything that came up today that we haven't touched on that you'd like to talk about or think about further? Uh, not really. I don't know how relevant it is, but I was struck by uh, some of the problems that float through here that reminded me so much of some of my own cases. Uh, and, and it seems that, for example, when uh, Judge uh, Bianco said uh, he was being told we can't do this and, and things like that, that reminded me of my own cases. And just for a reminder, uh, these are cases that went on for 20 years, uh, whereas by and, and first of all, the background of this, and we're gonna find this as a committee, uh, in, in whatever, we, uh, whatever we enact, uh, there are government agencies that don't want to be told by a judge or a legislature uh, what to do. Uh, and then they'll resist it in, in many different ways. And uh, sort of remind it uh, on my, medical case with the prisons, uh, I, I consulted with some of the top sociologists around the country. Two of my best friends are, have been former heads of sociology at Cal and of the National Association. And uh, 
we were talking about, I was talking about the resistance I was getting and, and the agencies saying, well, we can't do that. And uh, they looked at each other and said, Orsten Veblen, and that's a name I knew, the economist, the Danish, I believe, economist. And I said, well, what's that relevant for? He said, well, he came up with an answer for that called uh, trained incapacity. <laughs> government agency yeah. train themselves over time uh, to say, we can't do that, or we don't do that. And I, I see this operative here, and uh, I never got a hold of it, how I can make them do these things. But I think we have to keep this in mind. We can come up with all kinds of legislation, but if we have agents who say, we can't do that, or looking for loopholes, which is what I, I've found, uh, as, of to not make it happen, uh, we're not going to be as successful as we ought to be when we conceive of these things. I just, um, I think we, we need to keep that in mind. It certainly has been my judicial career of dealing with that and, and being frustrated by that, that attitude and that notion of trained incapacity, or we don't want to be told we know how to do things and we don't want to be told how to do them and looking for loopholes and ways out of it. So I, I don't know where that fits into this, but I think it's it's just hovering over everything. Well, we've just I, I certainly agree. It goes to, you know, whether you require counties to do something and you incentivize counties to do something and, you know, um, or you don't at all. I mean, it seems like a great program has flourished in, in Los Angeles County um, under current law, right? So that, um, but it was inspired by, I think a lot of, was talking with Judge Espinoza during lunch by a lot of um, civic activism. Um, and um, of course that's, you know, remains important too. Um, your point's well taken. Of course, we are, we're going to still try. I don't yeah, know. Oh, absolutely. We have to try. And, and, and. Well, we're talking about Truman Blood in the Army to take over some businesses. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we do, yeah. Um, one thing that uh, we haven't talked about today, and I don't know if um, is relevant even, is whether there's a racial dynamic in the incompetent to stand trial population. We've talked about it at every single one of our committee meetings and every single time you've scratched the surface, there's been a racial disproportionate impact. And I don't know if Dr. Warburton has that data as well, but I'd be interested to know. If I mean, there's something in the map of Right. Yeah. And I know that historically in, in research that I've done with mental health treatment within the prisons that, uh, Latinx populations are dramatically underrepresented, whether that's language, cultural on the diagnosis side, on the patient side, I don't know, but that seems to, and I think that that was in the data that you shared with us, right? It, 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 it was. Um, you know, you're, when we looked into this, it was surprising how much that didn't come up, um, okay. like every other area. Mm -hmm. There is concern, I think, that uh, People of color, and I think black people in particular, are often overdiagnosed as uh, being dangerous because of mental health issues. But you know, if you look at the the data from the state hospital, it's it doesn't quite map the rates of uh, felony defendants. So there is sort of less of the of the Latinx population, but it's um, pretty close. I wouldn't say pretty close, but I, I was surprised. I think Joe and I were both surprised that. That wasn't sort of a recurring issue that we heard when we look at sentencing enhancements or some of the other things. So, well, one place to go might be if you want to take a look at the other county jails that they're instituting. They maintain a dashboard. Or, they maintain a dashboard on the California jail population. That you also take that. Yeah. In the ODR population, did you see it as? Well, did we see racial disparity? Yeah, yes. So, in which way? As an example. Yeah. So are you more likely or less likely to get diverted? Oh, no. I'm sorry. There is data on, on our population. Uh -huh. And um, I, can't, I can't 
and excited that he was positively diverting just the people who thought it was we should be diverted based on the population in the jail. Mm-hmm. Population in the county is 9% African American, 30% of the general population, or 40% of the normal population. So, the Rivera, I believe the Rivera Dashboard has said that. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty long. Okay, well, of course. Um, perhaps that's worth looking at just because it remains part of our mandate. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how it fits in, but it's come up every other conversation. And the data that Peter just references. Concern. Um, all right. So that said, is there any other topics? I think that we've sort of exhausted the conversation from today. This doesn't mean that we're done with the conversation about competency. If things come up, either by staff or anybody on the committee, we can you know, certainly bring it up or bring it to Tom's attention. We'll have public comment in a minute. Um, is there anything else that, you go ahead. I think we, I think we captured this, but I think it would be worth it for staff to review. I'm assuming we will, as we have in the past, we'll finalize our recommendations for our report in, say, November or December. Yes. Given that, as I've indicated, this new, the new effort in the, the new initiative that the governor proposing that will, some version will be adopted in the budget, it is worth it because it will have bearing on the subject to evaluate it so that we have that information when we review our recommendation. I think that that's exact. And I, I envision that as part of the map, what I'm going to call the mapping project. Um, so, so we have an idea of the landscape. I think it will be helpful for when we make our recommendations in November timeframe, as Senator Skinner was referring to, but also should it become a recommendation, I think it'll be on the top of minds of lawmakers. Well, how does this interact with, with care courts or not? And if the answer is it has nothing to do with that, then that's fine, but we should have just like a clear like understanding of where those lines are. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so that's it. I think there's instructions on where to go from here in terms of further research and presentation in our next meeting. Yeah, I think we've solved it. Well, yeah, exactly. Everything's solved. We can all go home. Um, it does not close the conversation, but at least you know it takes us to the next step. Um, unless there's anything further from committee members, we'll go to uh, public comment. Did you want to do that before discussing the? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I. I excuse me. Before going to public comment, um, we'd like to hear back from staff and Tom has a short presentation about the proposals from our last meeting about victim, victim comp, comp, compensation and restitution. So a, a few people have their hands up. I'll just leave them up. So when we get to public comment, you won't, you won't lose your place in line. <laughs> okay. Let me, uh, give me a minute to get my presentation ready to go. Here we go. Judge Henderson, does that look okay to you? Can you see that? Okay, great. So we just have um, three proposals based from the last meeting uh, about victims' rights and services that we looked at. And we're gonna go over those uh, very briefly. So the first, so I'll just give you the, the roadmap. It's going to be restitution, restorative justice, and civil compromise, um, with them getting less complicated as we go on, perhaps. So the first one has to do with restitution. As, as we heard from a, a, a few folks at the meeting in February, uh, there's a tremendous amount of restitution ordered, um, but only a small percentage actually makes its uh, way to crime victims and often in payments of a few dollars for an extended period of time. It doesn't really seem to be serving anyone. The right to restitution for the victim is in the California Constitution, so it's something that the state takes seriously, um, but there seem to be these issues in actually making victims um, whole or at least fulfilling the goals of what restitution is supposed to do. So the uh, idea that um, the proposal that we have today is creating 
a system where the state pays restitution to the crime victim once the judge orders it. So the crime victim gets made whole and the state can decide what they want to do next to collect. So you wouldn't have the sort of irregular collection process burdening the crime victim anymore. One state that we've been able to find in the US does this, which is Vermont. So, you know, we might be able to find our number of high utilizers we have could all fit in Vermont probably. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is a model they have and they pay up to $5,000. And they exclude corporations and other entities that might have, you know, coverage from elsewhere. And, you know, Rick spoke with them. And what he learned is that almost every crime victim gets everything that they need, as a, you know, from a restitution point of view as a, as a result of this process. So it seems like a great model for us. Uh, the amount of restitution that's ordered in the state, as best we can tell, and something we continue to look into, is about $200 million a year. So, um, you know, that's a lot of zeros, but it's not perhaps an insurmountable amount. And that's what's ordered. That's what's actually collected is a small percentage of that. So this um, so actual restitution, not restitution fines. That, right, the actual restitution order. That's a great point of clarification. So it's money that uh, sort of the crime victim can show has a receipt for somehow. So, you know, something gets taken from you, or if there's medical expenses or lost wages, things like that, that would, would, would be what's in a restitution order. So it'd be a case where someone, you know, there's a final judgment in a case and the judge orders restitution, which is what they do now, would just be sort of creating a system for the state to be the one to, to pay it. Um, and I think the two things, two pieces of this is uh, the one I just said about the state is the payer. And then are there any entities that you want to exclude from getting these payments? Because I think we heard last time you know, there's some people who have restitution orders to corporations that are in, you know, the millions of dollars, and that just doesn't seem like a, perhaps an appropriate area for the state to step in on that. So that's the proposal in a nutshell. I, I, I like this proposal, and I think that it's, you know, it's a crime, that, again, no pun intended, that victims get so little of their restitution, um, and the, the, the trickling of payments from folks who are incarcerated that are a couple dollars you know a month here or there i think is it sounds like you're answering something it, is, it does it, it does i mean like this and every dollar counts but i imagine for some people it does add, add itself to injury um so i'm a big supporter um you know the, the question about excluding corporations so should shoplifters have to reimburse walmart is that basically what we're talking about uh, yes, I, mean, well, okay. I think it's a little bit different. Uh, I yeah. think it's actually should the if we should the committee was to recommend this proposal, would the state pay Walmart and it, mm -hmm. that's at first? And we're saying that part of this proposal that the committee should consider is that when the victim is a corporation, a government entity, there will still be a restitution order made by the court ordering the defendant to pay Walmart. Mm -hmm. But in that case. The state is not going to be the initial payer of restitution. And, and am I right that they're excluded in the Vermont statute? They are. And how do they define corporations? I'm not sure how they define it, but I, I think they have general language like corporations, government entities. And that, I think that's the language that's already used in our code as well. All right. Yeah. No, I, I think generally it's a, it's a good idea, but I have serious reservations about one the amount of Vermont is five thousand dollars. That seems like I don't know if the legislature would, would pass something like that. Then for property losses, I think legislature might say, well, the, the state is now becoming an insurer, and I think, uh, people might not like that. But in terms of like medical bills, uh, funeral bills. Things like that that maybe are for which there is no insurance or it's out of the realm for most people. Um, I think some modest amount. And then what is the state going to do in terms of recovering that? Are they going to go to a collection agency or get a lien or whatever? I mean, I think that's that really has to be um, clarified. Otherwise, it's again from defendant. But yeah. you know, they don't just get out of money without a lot of conditions and the amounts, even with a huge budget. But $200 million, uh, I mean, that's a big item. Well, even in California. Yeah. On, on medical expenses and 
funeral expenses, our victims' compensation Just program now provides use of state funds to give people some level of that money yeah. to apply for it. But what we found is only one out of five crime victims in California no, no. get any get any of that support. It's not just know about it, it's lots of obstacles. Yeah. Um, but what I don't know, I should, is whether when we pay the funeral expenses, do we also hold if we convict someone of it, are they then responsible to you know, is that something they then owe? That part I don't know. Brick might not. I think that it is as, as long as it's a part of the restitution order, okay. then in some cases victim compensation will step in and pay those expenses up front. Right. And then when it, uh, it collects those payments from the person convicted of the crime, instead of reimbursing the victim, they're just reimbursing the victim compensation for it. Yeah. Yeah. So we, that money so small, right? It's a small, it's it's limited in the number of offenses. Uh, it's limited in the violent offenses. There's a limited, uh, bills that victim compensation will pay for and in limited amounts. So this proposal would say whatever the restitution order is, that's what the person will pay. And we think that that amount will total around 200 a year if everything is paid. And that 200 million a year includes the government entities, the corporations, restitution order yeah. for that. So we actually think it would be smaller. If it was uh, limited. If it was limited, yeah. I mean, my feeling about this is the reason to answer a bit your question, uh, just as Marina, is that so much of what we've learned about and what we've talked about is social and systemic failures that are creating these, uh, these environments that cause a crime that, in the first place. That it seems like it's totally appropriate for the state then uh, to pay these losses for, you know, because in large part, this is it's a social failure. And, um, I'm not saying leave the uh, people who committed these crimes off the hook. I mean, of right. course, they're being punished. But I think the in, what we're trying to do is make victims as whole as possible, as well, they, as well as they should be. And to the extent that they are victims of a lack of social protection, then I think that they should be paid, whether they're called an insurer, sure, call us in a you know, state and insurer. And I think that's what we heard from Delaney Green at the last committee hearing, that if you look at other uh, countries, yeah. that yeah, they are insurer programs. It's, a, it's an acknowledgement of the state failure to keep the victim safe. And so they are treated as insurance type programs in other, in other countries. Yeah, I, I would think besides the limit on what the state will pay in terms of restitution, there should be some kind of should be income based too as to the victim. If you have a victim that's making $500,000 a year, restitution is over. Well, let them go out <laughs> collect the restitution, but the state shouldn't step in the shoes when that person probably has insurance or has an incentive to have insurance in the first place. Well, that, that's yeah. the idea, I think, of, yeah. you, of excluding the corporations and government. Yeah, it's a, it's also a different individuals. Too. Sure, you could means test it. I mean, you could means test yeah, it instead of, you know, excluding the corporations. Yeah. I, I don't, that's just my thought. I, I mean, I don't know what the political reality of it yeah. is, but I don't think, I don't have a problem with paying Walmart. Uh, to cut, you know, if they've lost, I mean, perhaps it encourages employment in the state. I mean, maybe then that benefit is more jobs. I don't know who's billions though, so just in retail. Well, it's, a, it's 200 million yeah. a year in California of all crimes. So, and that includes petty theft? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. it totally yeah, it's it's just, I thought it was in the billions. No, it's two, it's 200 million of all crimes. So you have to be and that's, of what's ordered. that's not losses. Yeah. That, that's of what is actually ordered by courts and restitution yeah. after a case is, reaches its final where the, and it's yeah. ordered. Yeah, I, that, it, where there's a conviction. More than million. <laughs> but but it, those are the 200 million that we're dollars that we're definitely sure about, yeah. right? Proved beyond reasonable doubt or admitted crimes yeah. and that the court feels is a justifiable restitution. So. Yeah. And, and just to add, uh, the state is also, you know, for those victims who are high earners and who have a crime committed against them in order of restitution, the state is still collecting on their behalf now. They're, and the state is spending a lot of money to collect those small payments right. on behalf right. of those folks. So just in terms of that distinction between high income people, 
the state is already spending a lot of money to collect from them, and it doesn't make a distinction. All right, and under the the because it's in the state constitution, that every victim has a right to restitution. So um, yeah, I, I imagine that those cases aren't too common. But, you know, a millionaire has a restitution. Well, the state can decide how to go after the right the dead, the dead beefs who are ordered to pay restitution. Right. My thought was whenever I ordered restitution, it's like an empty gesture. And it, it wouldn't be <laughs> if you were ordering at the same time somebody dropped off the state prison or jail. Yeah. <laughs> right. For a minimum, below below the minimum wage. Right. right. Can you yeah. hear testimony about? Victims with criminal history being excluded from the restitution. Yes, that's yes. correct. And the reason um, we aren't presenting on that today is because Senator Skinner has a bill that will uh, mm -hmm. address it. So, would this would this take out the victims' compensation bill? No, no. So we we really we thought hard about the difference between those two things. So victims' compensation. Uh, there is some overlap, but they are distinct. The victim's compensation, as long as there's a crime, there's not to be a criminal case or prosecution right. against the defendant. Right. If you can show you, you had some of these specified losses and specified offenses, and you paid for it, and you didn't get reimbursed, then you can apply to the state for reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Restitution is someone is arrested, prosecuted, and you've proven in court, uh, this is you know the losses that need to be compensated. So. It's very confusing. There's conceptual overlap, but we're just thinking about that court process as a way to some of the concerns we have, Justice Moreno. Is like otherwise, right? The state becomes insurer for sure. every offense, um, and maybe that is something that's appropriate. But this would be a way to sort of cabinet using the existing process. Um, that seems like it'd be an appropriate way to rethink restitution. Could we find out what the what the financial impact is if it's the, the, the reason to exclude corporations, insurance companies, and what it seems political and financial. Well, yeah. I guess I'm curious what the number is. Is it? We, we, you know, we, we, we've tried, and the data that we have doesn't distinguish between the types of things, but we'll keep looking. Okay. We've had that same thought. It would be great to put some numbers on that, but I don't have much hope that we'll be able to. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we like it. I like it. We're not voting on it today. Right. I think the thing that would help us, the staff the most, would just say this uh, This seems promising, keep working it up, and then when it comes time to sort of the final menu, um, we, you all can give a thumbs up or thumbs down at, at that point. But we want to sort of keep working on things and, and have some stuff banked. So when it comes time for the end, we'll have a good little more itinerary. I think it seems promising. <laughs> Keep on working up. But, the, but the question that I would love to know if we can find out, you know, what percentage of yeah. the dollar, the $200 million is to corporations and insurance companies and government agencies yeah. or guesstimate. That'd be great. Yeah. All right. The second idea has to do with restorative justice. So this um, is an idea that came to us from Jeff Reisig, who's the district attorney of Yellow County, just down the street, I guess and also the current president of the California District Attorneys Association. It wasn't from CBAA, that's just his role now. And the proposal I'm about to talk about isn't his proposal exactly. We modified it in a few important ways, so I don't, I don't want there to be confusion about that. But you know, I, you know, the committee has thought about restorative justice a lot. It was the subject of our first virtual meeting back in April of 2020. Um, and I think it's been a bit difficult to conceive of how do you sort of uh, put this into the penal code in a way that is sort of is meaningful. So casting it as a victim's right is a great solution to that. It lets the, puts the victim in control of whether they want to undergo a restorative justice process for this case. It, it lets them decide. Um, it doesn't, you know, not up to the prosecutor or anyone else. So the key, and, and before I get into the details of this, I just want to remind everyone too, we had a presentation from Steve Raphael, who had done research on a restorative justice program in San Francisco that showed uh, big reductions in recidivism for the defendants who were um, juveniles, who technically weren't defendants who had been through the program. So there's uh, and there's other studies showing similar improvements to public safety as a result, and also very high victim satisfaction, greater than ninety percent. Most, the vast majority of people who go through one of these programs liked it and would recommend it uh, to other people as well. 
So, you know, there's a couple of moving parts here. So I'll, I'll go through them quickly. I think a lot of them are common sense though. So the idea is that the organization running a restorative justice program uh, should be a community-based organization. In other words, it shouldn't be a division of the prosecutor's office or probation department or the court or something like that. It should be distinct from that process. The second, of course, is, well, who's gonna say these are um, programs uh, are restorative justice programs that they're sort of uh, approved by the um, right people. So the proposal that we have is that prosecutor can approve one, uh, the presiding judge or the superior court can, or the sort of local board of supervisors. So they have to be approved by, you know, the relevant party. And of course, that might be a place to um, have some discussion today about who would do that approval. The third point would be the one I started with, would be the victim would choose it. So they'd have to be told about the existence of this program and offer the opportunity to do it. And if they wanted to do it, um, so it would have to be done. The fourth is everything in there is confidential. So you have the um, openness and the approach to it from everyone involved and it won't be used later in court. That's a very important part. And the fifth is that it shouldn't be limited to low level offenses. It should be widely applicable to, you know, more serious um, offenses. And some of the research shows that restorative justice is most effective the more serious the offense is. Uh, and the sixth is that success is determined by the organization. It doesn't, you know, the court of prosecutor or anyone else doesn't need to sign off on it. If the organization says it works, it works and the case is dismissed. Um, and that would be a way to integrate restorative justice a little more fully into the penal code and encourage places to do it because there'd be a place in the penal code for this program. I have a question is how is this different from DA Rysik's proposal? His proposal was much more prosecutor focused. It was um, the program would be set up by a prosecutor. They would determine what offenses would be eligible and they would determine success. So it, this main difference is it takes it away from sort of being a prosecutorial program to being one that was a little more neutral or based on the, but a lot of these other aspects are sort of very similar. And do you think the confidentiality piece it's practical. So let's say you're a crime victim, right? So nothing is admissible that the um, person who was arrested could be admitted in court, but they could, could just go tell the police, like he threw the gun in the lake. He told me that, right? <laughs> I feel like I'm in my crim pro class. Uh, I mean, the fruit of the poisonous tree or something? Right. I mean, is that is that the way it works typically? Um, I think typically there's success in the program, so that sort of thing wouldn't come up. Okay. <laughs> Let me put it that way. But yeah, I think that could happen. And then I don't know if it's worth our time discussing. But All right. Let me think about it. I was curious. <laughs> I like it. Though. Has other jurisdictions, as far as we know, passed anything like this? So there are a few places that phrase restorative justice as a victim's right. Colorado, in particular, comes to mind. I don't know how robust it is, Rick. What did your research show about that? Colorado has the most robust laws of any state in terms of victims' rights, uh, in terms of restorative justice. There's a few other states that give varying rights to be informed of or to request um, restorative justice processes. Some states say, well, when one is in place, that you have the right to request it uh, or be informed of it. So there are various support in other jurisdictions for it. I, I really think that this is a really clever idea. I mean, I remember we struggled so much to how we create a, okay, we, we all agree for, you know, restorative justice is a great idea, has great outcomes, but how do we create a framework for it to work? And this seems to do that in a really sort of clever, creative way. Um, you know, just because you allow this, I mean, presumably this wouldn't be required, right? but it would just allow counties to do this. Um, you know, this gets to, Judge Henderson's earlier point about, you know, just because you create the law doesn't mean that it'll actually be done. But I think it's, I think it's a great idea. That, that was part of what DA Reisig um, said about it was it sort of legitimizes the process in a way that it would make some people more comfortable with it. Like he's saying, you know, it's in penal code 897.6 that would help. And I, I think there's some truth to that. And we should definitely use that penal code number if this goes anywhere. Let me put that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it currently is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, think, I don't think we go that high. <laughs> yeah, we will. And we shouldn't ask, underestimate how much uh, Judge Henderson got done with his orders also in those cases. I, I didn't want to let that pass. <laughs> okay. I don't think they were totally fruitless, Judge. <laughs> That's the problem with the There you go. <laughs>
Um, so again, I think unless anybody has anything else to add to this, I think this is, you know. We'll keep on keeping on. Yes, exactly. Okay, good. Last one, short but sweet, civil compromise. So this is an existing law. Uh, it was last updated, I think, in 1872. Uh, so about the time this meeting started this morning. Uh, <laughs> about the time uh, two of our community members woke up for the meeting. I guess. Um, and so the existing law applies to most misdemeanors. Some are excluded. And it says, you know, if the victim receives satisfaction, and that's the exact word in the penal code, satisfaction. If the court approves it, uh, the case can be dismissed. So it's sort of a way for victims to drop charges, uh, which isn't something that really exists otherwise. Uh, and typically what would this work out to would be, you know, you broke my window, here's 200 bucks, case is resolved, uh, to put it a little bit glibly. Um, but as we sort of spoke about earlier, uh, well, let me say, so th this has aspects of restorative justice to it, you know, it puts the victims in control and you're trying to repair the harm done by the offense and not necessarily um, uh, privilege other values over that. Uh, but for some people, they may not want to do a full restorative justice, you know, circle and the process and some of the uh, burdens that involve. And as I said, some of the research we've seen shows that restorative justice is not super effective for lower level offenses. The so civil compromise, I think, is a good compromise between um, some of those values and allows a, a victim to have a little more control over a case. And uh, the important thing, of course, is that the court, you know, the court has to get final approval of it. So if you had some fear of undue influence by the defendant on the victim, the court would be able to assess that out a little bit. So the things that um, our proposal here today has, you know, two pieces, which two is expand to some felonies and we'd suggest nonviolent, non-sex offenses as a starting point. And then to just put a little more clarification on what satisfaction is, that it doesn't just have to be money, it could include other sorts of things, community service or, uh, you know, whatever else might be appropriate for a case, just to, open up um, a little more clearly the aperture of these type of resolutions. I think this makes perfect sense. Robbery is obviously a crime that is violent, but it would be, seems like a potential avenue for civil compromise. I don't know if there's legislative or political appetite to allow that, but and I know that it's convenient for us to use the nonviolent, non-sex, right. like those categories right. that already exist, yeah. but it does seem that some robberies would be very appropriate. That could be a very mild, <laughs> like a grand theft. I, I think like a First auto, auto theft, the joy writing, those are the kinds of things that there's damage to the crimes. Right, I think that those type of crimes would be the most common ones. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there is, I still think this is a worth pursuing, but you know, there is a concern this allows people with money to buy their way out of cases. And that's why sort of, um, I think being clear that satisfaction could, is more than that uh, is important. Um, well, I think that I agree. So that makes perfect sense to me, but I think that maybe perhaps in the clarification of satisfaction, that is a specific admonition to the judge that while it may be some presumption in favor of dismissing it if the victim see, feels satisfied that, um, I don't know how to phrase it, but that's precisely that it's not the situation where um, the person who was arrested is buying their way out of. So my question about that was, do they then not have a record due to that? It's dismissed. Okay. Right. So, does it not favor the people with the ability to pay? Yes. Well, that, that's exactly what we're talking about yeah. and saying it does. I think it's too, it favors the people with ability to pay. We could put into it that says the judges are supposed, you know, supposed to watch out for that and basically I'm, not let's tell them, I don't, I don't know how to word it. That's up to different minds, but. I think pretty, right. Well, we can work on that. It's pretty direct about it, I would suggest. And so the other thing is, is sometimes victims just want their car fixed. They want, they want the money. You know, yeah, like, yeah. and should we just, and, sh and shouldn't we encourage that? Regardless of the, the bill, you know, okay, so it's some rich person who broke my window. I don't care who broke my window, I want it fixed. That's really what I want out of this. I think the rap sheet would show the arrest yes, okay. and then resolved by 1588. Where? 1578. 
<laughs> so it would be recorded as an arrest. It wouldn't be a you know. It would also be a reflection of the civil Civil Okay. Oh yeah, I mean that's that's another way to do it. Is it creates a whole new category. It's not a conviction. It's not a dismissal. Yeah. It's a civilly compromised. Yeah. So it still would be able. To, yeah, I just don't want to have a situation where the person who can't pay is going to then have the rap sheet that haunts him for the rest of the life, and the person who can doesn't have anything. Yeah. They often agree to make payments. Right. And then it comes back if they haven't mm -hmm. satisfied right. and you become like a collection agent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, how do we avoid <laughs> that? Or do we just have a free assault all the way? No, I don't think you know what one I you know there might be, you know, they're now bail funds where we'll still pay people's bail amount they couldn't otherwise. I wonder if there might be similar community organizations that, you know, could pay relatively small amounts for, for some of these things that folks who can't pay. But um, I don't know if we would want that. No. We could think of that. <laughs> yeah. Let's think you know, about but, it, it. but you're right. So I mean, forget about uh, a rich uh, offender, but some rich person comes in and says, I'm going to pay off everybody's well, the victim still has to accept it and the judge. So right. there'd be some, it'd still be those backstops. Okay, we're running towards the end of yeah. our time. Yeah. So I want to make sure, but I think that this is another yeah. promising area that we should continue to pursue. And really, I think those are three great reforms that came out of really concentrating on the victim, which is in some ways what we should be doing all the time. But, and we do, um, but in from a different lens. So I think that that would be, that'd be terrific. Okay, with that said, um, I jumped the gun earlier, but now it is time for public comment. Um, if anyone if you is interested in making public comment, please line up or indicated. For those listening on Zoom, I guess there's, no, there's nobody, nobody here. here. Oh, there's a couple people here. For those listening on Zoom to get in line, please select the raise hand function. If you're calling in, you may hit star nine. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and if you make public comment, your name or phone number may be displayed as part of the recording. We'll take a moment now to see how many people want to comment and based on that I will decide how long each person has to comment. Please know that the committee also accepts public comment in writing in many ways we prefer it and that comment may be emailed to committee staff whose emails are on the committee webpage. With that said, Tom, how many folks? We've got eight people lined up right now. All right, why don't we do 90 seconds each? Sure, you got the clock? I have the clock. Tom, will you admit folks? Let's do it. First up is Linda Mim. Hi, thank you for um, choosing me to speak. I want to thank you for the work you're trying to do in a very impossible situation on the penal codes. And I just want to bring to everybody's attention to the fact that these, the, the most ill, have serious biological, neurological, complex brain diseases that are treatable, but they need treatment up front before the psychosis. Um, it has a chance to really work on their brains and make them very sick and their chances of a good recovery uh, dwindle. So much as what you're trying to do is maximize public safety, we need to maximize doctors' abilities to use preventative medicine upfront to treat these patients before they hit your system. And I would say that the magic wand that you were asking about, uh, one of them is to really look at the LPS, change the gravely disabled <clears throat> and dangerousness factors, <clears throat> excuse me. So families and doctors, their, their hands are untied and they can get their loved ones into compassionate care. And I would say that in our state, we have an issue where, oh, an, uh, where something is being construed as an ideologic, ideological construct, when in fact, compassionate involuntary care is medically necessary life-saving care. So thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity to speak. And I wish you the greatest of luck in your, in your pursuits. Thank you, Ms. Mims. I mean, I, I think we share some, many of your concerns. Uh, the problem is of course, that the criminal legal system really comes at the end of the process. And uh, we want to encourage as much preventative care as possible. And that's something I think that all of us are committed to doing. So thank you. I, I can understand that. And I think that you're in a better position to help nudge your colleagues into looking at it this way. And, you know, I'm the vice chair of the Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance, and we're trying to get our state 
to recognize these as medical conditions that need urgent care, just like cancer, just like stroke, that sort of thing. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Next up, Jerry Silva. Hello, it's nice to be on again and to see some of your beautiful faces. Um, I really appreciate what this panel does. Amen, Linda, um, so needed. Every discussion that comes up is something I can relate to from people that I work with inside and outside in terms of crime victims. I, I wanna bring up something that I think is really important because last year you gave hope to so many people serving life without parole. And your recommendations for last year didn't seem to make their way into any legislation, which is not something that we cry over. We just figure out how we go from there. So we have a proposal from inside to take up that question of, of getting the board to review life without parole sentences after 25 years of incarceration. And I'm hoping that we can get help from this panel and to, to promote it with Jennifer Schaefer, to do, you know, to take it from a proposal um, and to something actual. So that's basically what I have to say. And I'd like to know who I can follow up with. Thank you, Jerry. It's always good to hear your voice. Um, you can certainly follow up with uh, committee staff. I mean, as you know, it was a formal proposal for us to, uh, here and um, but that does not mean that we you know are banding it just because this year the legislature didn't decide to pick it up it's something that we'll continue to press on with about it and you can kind of, you can reach out to me you know how to reach me or you can reach out to staff we have to chat with you for them. thank you crispy is next hi i'm crispy a survivor of harm and a mother I want to uplift what Teresa Pasquini said. This is a crisis of our humanity and we need to stop treating families like the enemy. My heart goes out to her and her family. I speak for Jasper Stallings who was incarcerated, who decided to allow someone who has done something horrific to stand trial without a clear psychological evaluation. The horrific actions could be a result of childhood trauma need help, not more isolation. So how can we screen for ACEs and also discover how we can help bring our society back to normalcy? I also speak for Dortel Williams, who is incarcerated. I believe context is paramount. We must shape laws to consider context because a system that is designed to help as many people in the most efficient way possible must consider the dynamics of people, their history, their situations, their context. Without that, we are cookie cutting and it takes decades to offer healing without context. And this is from me. Last Friday, the May revise of the state budget was released. I felt, I feel it defines who we are as a people and as Californians. When I see that $18 billion is proposed to support punishment, despite deductions in prison population and only 33 million is slated to help make victims whole, 18 billion versus 33 million. I ask you, who are we? Also, I'm uplifting the 254 human beings who died of COVID-19 while incarcerated in the recent COVID outbreaks in the carceral system. And lastly, my question from section A3 of the staff memorandum, I appreciate all the work that your staff does, uh, where it says that people who are unable to do these things because of a mental health condition of developmental disability are incompetent to stand trial and cannot be prosecuted until they are restored to competency. Shouldn't this also apply to taking plea deals? Thank you, I appreciate all the work you do. Uh, you, you packed a lot in there, Crispy. Um, so first of all, there are some great things we think in the budget, particularly regarding to our recommendation last year uh, for uh, community reentry programs. And um, I think that, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but you cannot plead guilty if you're, uh, if there's a suspicion even that you're incompetent to stand trial, there needs to be a formal evaluation for that. And we also definitely hear you on the victim's piece, that's something that we're trying to address as well. So thank you. Jane Carras is next. Good afternoon. It's good to um, be here again. Uh, I really appreciated uh, this morning's panel, this afternoon's panel, and of course, all the work that you guys are doing. Um, this morning, the chair remarked on the overwhelming power of Ms. Pasquini's wrenching testimony of her son's experience with our criminal legal system. Such lived experience must be an integral part of this committee's deliberations, not just 
one panelist. And so I urge you once again to lobby the governor to assign a directly impacted person to fill your vacancy. Further, um, one of the priorities that Senator Skinner stated at the close of last year was that this year the committee uh, focus on the experience of women in the criminal legal system. Ms. Jane Dorotic, who many of you know, um, finally was um, given uh, her true freedom yesterday, or excuse me, a couple of days ago, um, who you know spent 20 years of incarceration, both in both of our largest women's prisons, CIW and CCWF, she would be an ideal candidate, both her experience in our courts and in our prisons um, would make her ideal uh, to be a part of your work. Further, the loss of Professor Ochin um, from this committee means that we do not have any women represented here. So I, I really urge you, I know we do this repeatedly, we sound like broken records, but it's vital that an impacted person um, uh, serve on this committee. I'm sorry, I did, Chris just reminded me that of course, Senator Skinner is um, yes. on this committee, but um, we, need, we need more voices from women and from impacted women. And I thank, thank you. you. We, we are actually, we are in the process of working with the governor's office on our uh, filling our vacancy. And I hope that you will be um, encouraged by uh, the next appointment. Yolanda N is next. Hi there, sorry about that. Thank you committee um, for all your hard work and your dedication. Um, Honorable Henderson, I wanted to let you know you're not alone. I had very difficult time hearing um, most of the meeting. It was very difficult. So I just wanted to let you know you weren't alone. We were, we were right there with you. Um, I really wanna talk about, um, I was gonna repeat a lot of what Jane just said um, about Jane Dortick and how um, she is an exonerated innocent survivor and she's finally freed from a second trial. The, the main thing is um, yesterday, the San Diego DA dropped the retrial against her for insufficient evidence. So we really need to review the prosecutorial misconduct that happens so frequently. Instead of finding facts of cases, they run with an imaginary theory. It's time for the truth and justice to start taking place factual evidence over theory. Jane Dortick would be a great candidate to be on this committee. Um, she is a compound freedom fighter. She knows what it's like from the courtroom to inside the cement walls. She knows how unjust it all is. So I wanna thank you so much for your time and your dedication and look forward to the progress you make. I also remind, want to remind you, my husband has served 28 years on an LWAP sentence, costing the state over two and a half million dollars. It's time for change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just picking up on the issue of wrongful conviction, which is an area that we have not yet focused on, but I think we'll at some point in the not too distant future, the committee will take that up. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Michelle Funes. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm a social worker. Those of us in the trenches and treatment of these issues have unique and important perspectives, and I really feel that we need to be at this table. The concern I have in listening to today's conversation is the lack of discussion about involuntary or mandated treatment, including medication, especially for people living in the community. Mandated treatment can't only take place in a hospital bed. Short term, weeks long, LPS inpatient stays are not enough. The average three month DSH stay is not enough time. Dr. Warburton talked about it taking two years before personal involvement can inject tools in enough insight and organization to take more events on their own. So we have another 21 months until we can expect this person to have a level of insight and organization to take medication independently. This is where the revolving door comes in, in my opinion. 
Voluntary engagement and treatment by ISC defendants is almost by definition mutually exclusive. It's because they have been refusing treatment that they are incompetent. Can the court find you incompetency? Incompetency does not change that. The only thing that changes is the involuntary treatment that can be Dr. Walker referred to DSH sending people restored to competency back to the same situation that precipitated their arrest. I would say a core piece of that situation is that treatment and medication are once again voluntary. This is for people whose very illness prevents them from seeing they have an illness. Teresa Pasquini talked about how we need to make it easier to get care, that a patient shouldn't have to be very disabled or even really dangerous to get care. But one doesn't have to be those things to get care. They have to be those things to get involuntary care. That's what care via the LPS route or via the DSH route have in common, and they're involuntary. This is directly I'm sorry, I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Me. I'm sorry to interrupt, but your, your time is up, and I actually, the audio was uh, difficult to hear you. And getting back to the pre previous caller, right, we are still working on our technology to make uh, these okay. hearings. I, I, sorry that you couldn't hear me. I just have a tiny bit more, if you'll allow me. Sure, quickly. I can hear you now. Okay, great. So I was talking about the need for involuntary care. It's directly related to SB 317, the first step being a mental health diversion referral. It's mental health diversion is optional. And from what I've seen thus far, usually declined. AOT lacks an involuntary medication op option and conservatorship is rarely an option. Um, the former IST misdemeanor process had an involuntary treatment option that's now gone. Finally, we in county government are not failing to treat these people because we are not mandated to do so, as has been suggested here today, but because we cannot compel these people, these very sick people, to work with us. If they're psychotic and delusional, as is often the case in incompetency cases, they decline our services. I'll send my, uh, the rest of my comments in writing to the committee. Yes, that would, be, that would be most helpful. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Marion Wickard is next. Hey, I think I'm last. Good afternoon. Yeah, the prisons are full of people with taking mental health meds without any further treatment. They need treatment, not just drugs. Mental health is an important issue, one I'm blessed that I don't have to deal with. However, when I was the IFC Inmate Family Council Chair at Lancaster Prison, one of our members had a son who was confirmed with mental health issues. They were continually fighting for their son to receive mental health treatment and not treated as though he didn't have any problems. The last time I saw them, their son was in the hole and being transferred to another prison for severe punishment. It was heart-wrenching. Their fight was so sad. I hope they are alive to see the changes that are happening and their son is receiving better treatment. And by the way, I support restorative justice. Thanks for everything you guys do. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Uh, Deborah Blair Porter is next. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you for your time. Um, very quickly, I'm the parent of an adult who has a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder at a very young age. Um, he has been and was in the criminal justice system and the competency system for the past five and a half years before we finally got the case dismissed. Um, I'm concerned because there's been no real mention of 1370.1 um, and those who are in the competency system but do not have mental health issues. Um, this case was basically caused by the failure uh, to consider, acknowledge, or address disability in a way that made any difference. Um, this tends to disappear people with disabilities, including developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, we, um, you know, you guys are doing a wonderful job. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, but you are not the people in, out there on the front lines in terms of prosecutors and judges who are failing and refusing to consider disability. And there are people in the criminal justice system who should not be uh, in the system because they are having their disabilities criminalized. Um, and no one is looking at this, uh, at least in my experience. What's happening is that no one has a handle on the number of people with disabilities coming into the system. So it's a back end issue. There are several points at which these issues could be addressed um, at the point where a parent asks for accommodation. Um, when you ask for an accommodation, you specifically identify a developmental disability, which should trigger PC 1122 and PC 1369, they ignore it. 
Um, even rule 4.130, which has an advisory comment that I think talks about people versus vitiati, which talks about a concern that doesn't rise to the level of a doubt. Um, that should be raising um, bells and people should be doing something. Also, People v. Castro says that- um, Can I apologize to interrupt? It seems like you have a, you know, a wealth of knowledge here and it would be great if you could send a longer comment to uh, staff with some of these specific citations to us. But I will say that it was our oversight a bit to not concentrate enough on people who are developmentally disabled and not mentally ill or in the competency system. And I think that it's something that we should make sure that we are following up on in our staff evaluations, including the numbers. I'd be curious to know what um, those numbers are. So I, I do think, and it, and it gets, I think, I, I hope I'm not being completely ignorant here, but it gets to the issue that we've been talking about permanently um, incompetent. Non-restorable. Non-restorable, yeah. perhaps. In any event, thank you very much. Sure. Mary Moreno is next. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I just want to um, say thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to um, attend via Zoom for some of us that are in LA area and far away. Um, I really appreciate that. I appreciate all the work that you guys are committed to doing. Um, I'm not going to go on a rant because everybody that spoke before me said everything that I wanted to say, but I do just wanna say that, you know, working in mental health, I've realized a lot of the things that, that were said before me. And I think a, a big barrier to, people receiving services is that they can opt out of, you know, receiving services. And that's, that's really concerning. And I think, you know, it's about time that we stop incriminating people for the symptoms they suffer, you know, from their mental illness. So again, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for the work that you guys all do, and how committed you guys are to making change. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for calling in and for your comments. Um, I do think that the question about um, involuntary treatment is, is a difficult one. Um, it's made a little bit simpler, I think, in the criminal context, but I think it is, um, it's very complicated, as we mentioned today. And it looks like our last comment is from Flower Alvarez Lopez. Ms. Lopez? Ms. Lopez, are you there? Yes, I'm unmuted now. Hello. Um, my name is Flower Alvarez Lopez, and I'm with Pillars of the Community and an organization called Universidad Popular. This topic is important to those of us from San Diego because of the connection between the jail deaths that have been we have been devastated by and um, including one of my loved ones that passed away in custody. I wanted to point out um, to the committee the recommendations from the ISC solutions report. So those of us that um, have been on the ground um, dealing with this issue have really tried to incorporate those solutions and the recommendations as solutions and the work that we do. We have AB 1630 that has actually, um, that's coming out of San Diego that has incorporated some of the those recommendations in, in the bill. Through Participatory Defense San Diego, we have been on the ground with families and, that have loved ones incarcerated with mental health issues. And we have witnessed firsthand how the court system has chewed them up and spit them out without regard. And I just wanna let you all know that I stand with Moms Against Torture they're the moms um, organizing in San Diego that have their incarcerated um, children. And uh, I want to thank you all for addressing this issue. And you all have a good, wonderful rest of your day. Well, th thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate your comments and everybody who has joined us um, all day today. It was another long session, but I hope a productive one for everyone. It certainly was helpful to us. And uh, we will adjourn now. And please stay tuned for one more person. Signed up. Okay. Is it, what's your, who is? I can't read the name from here. Anthony Hernandez. Mr. Hernandez, if you would make it quick. We're... Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I feel privileged to be the last one to speak, but 
There's so much to say. I am a, a family advocate as well. I've been thrusted into this scene seven years ago after a family tragedy. Although we do have a, a positive outcome, we made it all the way to Patton State Hospital. And as of two months ago, we're out. Uh, look us, uh, our story up. We are over 5,500 families strong across the country. We go by the name of Transforming Treatable Tragedies. Our website is www.transformingtreatabletragedies.org. We've been to Washington. We've worked with Tim Murphy, Fred Reese, uh, Dr. Tor uh, Fuller Tory. So we have a, a good story to tell. Uh, we were, uh, someone called it, dragged through the glass of the Department of Behavioral Health uh, System. Yes, it is dysfunctional at the time, uh, but we're working on it. We have faith in you guys. We have faith in the system. Uh, we are uh, just families trying to do the best for our loved ones. So thank you for the effort. Please look us up and, and contact me if we can do anything together. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And I also uh, encourage you to reach out to staff if you have specific recommendations or comments to the proposal that we discussed today. With that said, I, as I was about, as I was saying earlier, I think this is a productive day. Thank you all, especially to our staff, Senator Skinner staff, everybody who made this possible but our, with our hybrid session. Judge Henderson, it's good to see you as always. Sorry you couldn't join us today. And with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.